Narayanam Namaskar Tomin, Narum Tavin, Okum, Devim Sarasatim, Biasam Titoji, Yodirit, Nesto Preshu, Bhadrishu, Nityam, Bhagata Seva, Bhagati Otomashoki, Bhakti, Bhavati, Nastiki, Nigamaka Puru Garitam Param, Shukamakaramita, Javi Samitam, Pivata, Bhagatam Rashamarium, Mahora Hursi, Pavika Bogam, Krishna Sadam of Bhagate, Damagani, Karona Stadi Samasha Paranako, Duno Ditam. Tom of Pia Dabu Shooter, Bishop Tumby Bow, some Rapi Arena Bidumbrik, Saram Prakyahi to Home, Ardenum, some place in Nirvana Musanti, Nanya to Hum. And Arti Bashamam Shakchad, Bakti Yoga, Maloka Sajana, Chakra, Satpere Samitam, Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu, Guru Dev Maheshara, Guru Shaksha, Parabara, Tashmai, Sri Guru Vedam, Dugame Patimi and the Shah, Scatter Patea, Guru Shaki Bayas and Andu Santus and Dovidamadam. Mukha Kavi Pikari and Shabra Shmarani, Panga Gil Langa de Dekari name. O Maganantiman and the Shangarangana, Saraka Chaksurun, Militam Yanatash Mai, Sri Guruvedam Ham. Sri Chetanman of Wisdom, Stabitam Yanabutere, Swayam Rupa, Karamayam Dalati, Shaw Paranticum. Bande Ham Sigiru Sirta Parakamanam, Sri Gurun Vaishnavam Sta, Sri Rupam Sagaditam Sahagana, Raganatam Vitam Stam Sadevam, Sadvaitam Savadutam, Parijana Saitam Krishna Chetanya Devam. Sri Radha Krishna Paran Sahagana Ladita Shri Vishikan Vitam Sham Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutare Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Ramane Namaste Sarasati Devi Guravani Pachadine Neva Shesha Sanivari Paskita De Sadharine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaya Tikadadha Shiva Sri Gaur Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Ram, Hari Ram, 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 Hari Hari. Good morning. I've got Rob and Kel with me. Jean on Facebook and a couple of others. This is Motivational Monday. Thank you very much for joining us. We had some adventures since our last Wisdom Wednesday session. Bye's been monitoring sites whereby you could acquire specially plumaged and colored birds, for instance, scarlet macaws. They normally sell for eight to ten thousand dollars if you can get them, which you have to go on a waiting list for two or three years, and then you don't even know what you're getting. <clears throat> if you go online, there are supposed macaws for sale for three, four thousand dollars, but uh, if you read the reviews, none of those so-called brokers have any birds. They're just getting a deposit from people and not giving them the birds. It's a lot of scam. They don't, they, I, I contacted one in Riverside and I said, well, I'm coming down to Southern California next week. I can stop by and see you. And all of a sudden I never heard from them again. So they have neither a physical location nor do they have any birds, but they will take your money. So to get a beautiful bird like this is almost impossible. And yet with the birds we have, we have a military macaw and a blue and gold macaw and an African gray tracks Hundreds, if not thousands, of visitors to the temple every year. People are in awe of the birds. It's a big, big draw. And so we thought if we could get a scarlet macaw or a hyacinth macaw, it would be great. But almost impossible to achieve. And should we be able to get one, it would cost ten to $15,000 and take two or th at least a year or two before they would hatch and be able to come to you. And Bye Bobby was monitoring one bona fide site run by a man who's genuinely pet friendly, genuinely on the level. She saw a little reference, an, a, an oblique reference in one of his posts to a lady in um, Southern California, in San Diego, who had a bird. Her, it was given to her by her husband some years ago and then he passed away in 2017. She sold their nine acres of land in Oroville and moved in with her son and daughter and grandchildren the apartments, got, the living facility got smaller and smaller and smaller, and the cause loved to chew things, and so <laughs> it became untenable. And she's a very nice lady, genuine spiritual seeker. She asked a lot of questions about the temple, about yoga and Krishna consciousness. We're going to send her a back to Godhead subscription, as well as a copy of the Bhagavad Gita. And she's coming up and visiting in May on her birthday. She was very delighted to place the bird in a good home. She donated the bird without any cost whatsoever, but the only condition was we had to drive to San Diego. So I said to Bai Bobby, I said, if we're going to get this bird and some, you know, we better strike while the iron's hot. This is an 
once in a lifetime opportunity. So we just jumped in the car Thursday night, drove to St. George, uh, made it to uh, San Diego by the following afternoon, met with the family, it was, got along really, really well with everybody, uh, and then arranged to pick the bird up at seven o'clock on Saturday morning, we did so. And we made it back by you know, 12, 13 hours later. And um, you know, his name is Oscar, he's eight years old. He's had the one owner. He seemed to like the traveling. He seemed to take to me and by Bobby. Didn't seem to be particularly traumatized. He likes his freedom. He's never been much caged up. So he likes to stay on top of the cage rather than in the cage. He lets anybody pick him up. He doesn't really bite. He could do some major damage with that huge beak of his, but he doesn't. He seems to be an ideal, gentle bird. And so next time you come to Spanish Fork, check out Oscar, the newest Bakta, Bakta Oscar. A couple of weeks ago, we lost Bakta Ram, the Lama. Now we've got Bakta Oscar. So someone commented that the, the number of devotees in your team remains the same. You lost one and you gained one. So yeah, we have the same number of team members that we had two weeks ago. Krishna takes away and Krishna provides. So I can't wait for the weather to be warmer and Oscar to be displayed in the huge, and it's almost prescient, it's almost like Bhai Bobby could see the future because she spent a lot of time, a lot of time, she and the volunteers, spent a lot of time this winter expanding the aviary, making it twice as big, making it more secure, putting in various amenities, almost as if she had a preview that we would get another big, big bird. So Krishna provides, I'm thanking Krishna from the bottom of my heart that we were able to make that 1400 mile drive safely without any negative incidents, that the bird was perfect, the owner was perfect, a wonderful relationship with them, which I think will be ongoing. And we arrived back safely due to the grace of God. Safely back here to get, connect with you on Motivational Monday to discuss a brand New verse. I think we spent seven sessions on the last verse. This will be part one. Good morning. Anjali says, thank you for giving Oscar his forever home. Yes, from here, he needn't go anywhere. Of course, my Bobby and I haven't got that long to go. So we are looking for the second generation. We're looking for those in, in whose hands we can entrust Oscar and Pedro and all the llamas and the peacocks and all the tourists and all the facility that's here in, and in Salt Lake City. So if you're a young devotee with 50 years of preaching ahead of you, by Bobby and I, who may have only minutes or days or hours or a few years at most, would love to train you up, give you a roof, give you a means of support, give you, uh, give you all the preaching that you can handle. Good morning, Natasha, Hare Krishna. Good morning, Jay. Jay, you want to think seriously about coming up here. I saw you DJ. You're you're awesome. And you could add something to the Festival of Colors. And your wife, Kara, she's into it. She said road trip. Anyway, give it a thought. And uh, again, another thought you could kick around is combining with Anjali, partnering with Anjali. It was a magnificent voice. You guys could maybe do your own act up here on stage. Anyway, that's... Uh, Thoughts that are banging around in my head this morning prior to discussing the 31st verse in the 6th chapter of the 1st canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Here it is. Anta bhagish te lokam sivim parigam yaskandita anugrahen mayanam avika gita kachin. Narada says, since then, since being orphaned, and since the ashram closed up after the termination of the rainy season, the Chatur Mas, the sages went their various ways. By the grace of Almighty Lord Vishnu, Anugrahem Mahavishnu, by the grace of Vishnu, Bahirantas Chalokam Srim, I travel unrestrictedly both in the transcendental world and in the three divisions of this material world. This supernatural ability of mine is due because, is given to me, gifted to me because of my unbroken devotional service to the Lord. Mam chiyab bachonang bhakti yoga na shagunam samatit chaitan 
Brahma, Buya, Kalpate. Souls, eternal souls, part and parcels of God, fall from the spiritual world because of the curiosity to know what it would be like to live independent of God. And when they fall, the ropes, the chains that keep them rotating this material life after life are called gunas. Guna means ropes. And there are three of them. Gunas, passion, ignorance. And depending on what guna you're in or what combination of gunas you're in, you find yourself in one of the three spheres of this material world. There's the Urdhvaloka or Shwaloka, the higher planets, heavenly planets, you might say. When we talk about heaven in Krishna, we're not talking about the kingdom of God. When we talk about heaven, we're talking about a better place within this material world where generally the demigods live or the pious living beings live. They're called Urdhvaloka or Shwaloka, the topmost planets, the highest of which is Brahmaloka, the planet of Lord Brahma, the creative universe. Dropping down one level, you have Madhyaloka, or the midway planets. And we're a, a Madhyaloka planet. Earth is a Madhyaloka. Things are not too heavenly. They're not too hellish. Kind of in the middle. And this is the ideal platform from which you go back to home, back to Godhead. You cannot generally go from the higher planets, nor can you go from the lower planets, but you can go from the middle planets. The reason you don't go from the higher planets, at least directly, is because it's too nice there. You don't even think about the pangs of birth, death, disease, and old age. The reason you don't go from the lower planets is it's not nice at all. You're too harassed by the various miseries of material nature, and you don't have the time or the energy to execute spiritual life. But if you take birth in a human form on Madhya Lokam, in the middle planetary systems, you have to execute devotional service and use that planetary level and that human form of life to finish up here and go back to home, back to God. There are so many statements that say, who does not take advantage of that human form of life on the middle planetary systems is a killer of the soul. Uh, there is no greater tragedy than to get all these assets, the boat of the human form of life and not use it to ply across the ocean of birth and death. Um, and then we go to the Adho Tamaha, the lower planetary systems, which are plunged in darkness, where the sinful living beings do. Urdvam gachanti sattvisha madhyata shanti raja gachani guna vrajashu adho patanti cha. And each one of these planetary systems resonates with one of the modes of material nature. Those in the higher planetary systems are in sattva guna. They're in the mode of goodness. Now remember, now listen, guna is still there. Again, when we say heaven, we're not talking about the spiritual world. Those on the heavenly planets are still within this material world. They're still experiencing birth, death, disease, and old age. They do have a higher standard of living. They have a longer lifespan. Birth, death, disease, and old age are not as miserable as they are here and in the lower planets, but they're still present. Those who are in the higher planets correspond to the mode of goodness. Those who are in the middle planets, they correspond to the mode of passion. And those who are in the lower planets correspond to the mode of ignorance. Therefore, we find this verse in the Bhagavad Urdmam. Kachanti Shadvishta, those in the mode of goodness, pious, righteous people who are vegetarians, who do not eat the flesh of other living entities. Deva Samyakam Apayatanam, Krimi Vibhasya Sangatam, Bhuta Tritkakaram, Kimbaro Nyarayaram. In the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam, it is said that people are so proud. They go to the gym, they lift weights, they, you, go, you go to the gym, there's mirrors everywhere so you can check out your latest muscles. You wear a tank top that reveals as much of your anatomy as you can. You get a washboard stomach. You get buys, tries, lats, all these different things. And you become so comely to look at in the mirror. And yet all this effort and all this, there's nothing wrong with working out. There's nothing wrong with muscles. But the preoccupation, the obsession with it is unnatural. It's out of balance. And so for all that you do, to make this body beautiful and attractive and strong and muscular. If then you, you eat meat, you can perform sinful activities in the mode of ignorance by eating meat. And many weightlifters and gym rats think they have to have meat in order to build muscles, which nothing could be further from the truth. Check out the movie Game Changers on YouTube or Vimeo. Nothing could be further from the truth. So after this lifetime, no matter how beautiful or comely or strong, this body is, or no matter how proud you are of this body, this body will be 
ripped away from you and you will have to take birth in the mode of goodness, either in a animal form uh, in this life to be sent to the slaughterhouse over and over and over again, or on the heavenly planets. Therefore, it is said, Those who perform sinful activities like eating meat, taking intoxicants, uh, engaging in illicit sex and gambling, no matter how beautiful or wealthy, good-looking, well-connected they are in this life, they are spoiling those assets. They are spoiling those virtues, misusing them to the point where as soon as they leave this body, they will find themselves in a hellish condition, either in a stockyard on this planet destined for the slaughterhouse or on the lower planets, living a hellish life in which there's no opportunity. There's no ray of light with which you can execute devotional service. So by all means, dear friends, please realize the rare and valuable gift of this human form of life and use it to finish up birth and death as a material one and go back to home, back to God. And you realizing that even up to the planet of Lord Brahma, even up to the heavenly planet of Lord Brahma, they are all, the higher, the middle, and the lower, are all certified by the Lord in the 16th verse, 8th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Abrahma, Bhuvanalaka, Purnavritina, Mama Petra Purnar Janma Navidyate. They are all certified as places of birth and death. Uh, now, this entire universe, consisting of the three planetary systems, is enclosed. There's a layer of earth, there's a layer of fire, there's a layer of water, there's a layer of ether, there's a layer of mind, there's a layer of intelligence, a layer of false ego. This universe is enclosed. It's like a football and it's floating on what's called the causal ocean. And beyond this universe, also floating the causal ocean, are many, many other uncountable material universes. Then beyond the Mahatattva, the greater expanse of the material world, which is sometimes compared to like a cloud in the spiritual sky, is the transcendental world. In that world, beyond all the material universes, there is a self-effulgent world. No need of sunlight or moonlight or electricity. Everything is illuminated by its own spiritual essence. And that is the kingdom of God. Beyond the middle, the lower, and the heavenly planets of this particular universe, beyond all the universes, beyond the greater expanse of the material creation, there is a self-effulgent spiritual sky. And in that spiritual sky, there are many what's called by Kunta planets, where the Lord is worshipped as Lord Vishnu by eternally liberated souls. Now, Yasha Hamanugunri Harishe Tad Danam, Danam means gift. On the strength of his devotional service to the Lord, this five year old boy, nowadays, if you have a young child, both parents are gone, he's living on the streets, he's called child at risk. The school counselors will call him child at risk. These are the kids who have the greatest percentage of crime and drug abuse. The ones without parents, the ones homeless, without any protector. So Narada Muni fits that profile. He would have been called by modern day counselors as a child at risk. And yet, because he was fortunate enough to associate with pure devotees of the Lord and hear the kata. And taste the prasharam, the remnants of their prasharam, and do some service to them. All these elements of devotional service that were performed by this young boy added up to his receiving danya, the gift from God that at the end of the creation. And when there was a recreation, when all the living entities, including Lord Brahma, the Rishis, the seven sages, and the demigods, and the hosts of moving and non-living beings, were once again manifested from the body of the Lord, Narada Muni also came back. He came back, but he came back in a transcendental body, on Tir Bahish Chalokam Singh, a body with which he could travel 
unrestrictedly within the lower, the middle, the upper planetary systems of this universe. Not only that, he could go through, he could transit the covering layers of this universe and emerge at will into the self effulgent spiritual sky where the Lord is worshipped in his four-handed Vishnu form by many, many pure, liberated devotees. So it says, in this material world, in this floating universe, there are living beings who are symptomized by the three modes of material nature. Goodness, passion, and ignorance. These are ropes that bind them. The ropes that bind one in the mode of goodness may be viewed as golden ropes. And the ropes that bind one to birth and death in the lower hellish planetary systems may be seen as crude iron shackles. But whether you're bound by golden ropes or whether you're bound by iron shackles, that's not the point. What you're bound by is not the point. The point is that you're bound. You're bound in goodness. You're bound in passion. You're bound in ignorance. But here's the shining example. Here is our guide, Narada Muni, who is not bound by any of those modes of material nature. What is the cause of his liberation? What is the cause of his unconditional life? Why is able to freely and unrestrictedly travel wherever his mind takes him? Mam chavanam, bhakti, sagunam samitita, brahmavi, who is engaged in the pure devotional service of the Lord, transcends the three modes of material nature, and comes to the same level as Krishna. Krishna is the creator of the material and spiritual worlds, can travel unrestrictedly anywhere in his creation. Ajo pishana vyadma bhutaram pragadim shamanish sambhavami atma maya. There's nothing that can stop. People say, well, how could God come here? So you can stop him with your skepticism, with your cynicism, you can stop him because you doubt that he could come here. What is your doubt? What is your skepticism? What is your cynicism? Who are you? You didn't create this world. You just appeared here. You're a renter. You're passing through. You're an interloper. God created everything. Of course, if anybody can come, it's him. If anybody has the right, the undisputed right to travel within his creation it is God. However, should be obvious that this is not his preferred place of travel or sojourning. It's dark, it's full of matter, it's full of souls who uh, are fallen and unaware of their spirituality, who fight, who quarrel, who are envious of each other, who are mischievous, who are sinful. God doesn't come here for a vacation. It's not like the president going to play golf when God comes to this material world. He comes rarely, and he comes on a mission of mercy. Sometimes the president will visit the prison house. It's not because the president is vacationing in the prison house. He doesn't call and say, reserve me a cell for the weekend. I need to get away from the pressures of the White House, and I'm going to kick back and enjoy myself in a cell. That, you know, that, that'll never happen. The president takes on the burden of going to this distasteful place out of compassion and mercy for the people who are incarcerated there. If the president appears within the prison house, it's not his preferred vacation spot, but rather he's making a sacrifice for the benefit of the prisoners, hoping to inspire in them a sense of right and wrong, to rehabilitate them and to reintegrate them into society. So when Krishna comes, a Jopishan, he's unborn. So why does he then appear to take birth in this inferior energy, in this material world? A Jopishan Abhyatma Bhutanamish, he's the Lord of all living beings. He hasn't got to come in the prison house. He's got plenty of space in the effulgent spiritual world. He's got plenty of much, 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 much better associates in the form of the eternally liberated souls in the spiritual world. But he comes here in order to try to exhibit the nature of the spiritual world and to inspire us to turn things around and go back to home, back to God. And otherwise, when the Lord comes 
as he did 5,000 years ago, in his original transcendental form as Krishna. Most of the inhabitants of this material world do not recognize him. They do not recognize him. Prabhupada tells a story that during the fight for the liberation of India, Gandhi organized nonviolent protests all over India. And out of the 30, from the 30 years it took to kick the British out of India, he spent half of those years in prison. So Prabhupada said when Gandhi would go to prison, the other prisoners would say, Oh, why is Gandhi here? I thought he was a saint. What did he do? Pickpocket, extortion, embezzlement. Because that's all, that's all they could think. They only understand others based on their own activities, their own point of reference. They couldn't understand that Gandhi was imprisoned because of his fighting for the higher cause of the liberation of India from the yoke of colonial rule. So when Krishna comes, he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, a Jopishan, he's unborn, a Vyayatma, he's infallible, a Bhutanam Ishara, he's the Lord of all living beings, and that includes Brahma, Shiva, Ganesh, all the demigods, he's their Lord, Bhutanam Ishara, Prakritim Shamadishna, and he comes out of causeless mercy to do good to us. But the living beings in this material world, being cast in the darkness of matter, conditioned in the modes of the three modes of material nature, bound up by those ropes, generally speaking, cannot recognize Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Why not? Bhagavad Gita, 10th chapter, 2nd verse, it says, Namebi dur shraganam pravava marish aham adiyati devanam marishanam chasarvasham. Krishna says, Neither the host of demigods, nor the learned sages, the rishis, the prajapatis, know my origin or opulences, for in every respect I am the source of the demigods and the sages. Because he is their source, because he preceded them, they cannot know him, at least not by direct perception. I cannot know my great-great-grandfather. He preceded me by maybe 100, 150 years. There's no way I can, at least empirically, have any direct contact or experience of him. I may know about him from family archives, from my grandmother who may still be surviving and who rem may remember him in her youth as an old man. But there's no way by my own efforts, no matter how smart I am or no matter how many research tools I have, microscopes and telescopes and yada, 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 there's no way I can determine the source of my existence. And so similarly it is said, Ishwara Paramakrishna Satchinana Anadira Dirgavan Sarva Karana Karana. Krishna is the cause of all causes. He, he caused everything. And everything, when it came into being, Krishna caused cause and effect. He caused cause and effect. This whole world is based on cause and effect. Everything is the effect of a previous cause, and it in itself is the cause of a forthcoming effect. But Krishna, or God, stands outside of the whole interaction of cause and effect. He's called Saiwa Karana Karana. He is the cause of all causes. And because he is not caused by anything, nor is he the effect of a previous cause, it is impossible for any conditioned soul bound by the three modes of material nature to know him by empirical speculation or scientific research. Even the demigods declare themselves unable to know the Supreme Personality of God and what to speak of the puny scholars on this tiny planet. Let's take the statement of Lord Brahma as found in the seventh canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is Prahlad's statement, but he's describing the situation of Lord Brahma. Tatsamavaha kavira teori prashanam tam bijam, bijam means seed, atma yatatam sabahir bachintayam, bahir means this external material energy, nabinar abdasatam apsunimajanam, jate yankaram katam upolabeta bijam. Lord Brahma appeared prior to the creation on the top of the lotus flower which sprouted from the navel of Garbhadakshay Vishnu. He lies 
on the bottom of the Garbadak Ocean, the bottom of the universe. From his navel sprouts a lotus flower. And Lord Brahma does not appear from the womb of any mother or father. He's self-born, manifests on top of that lotus flower. He looks around and there's nothing but darkness. He looks around. And at first he thinks, I will discover the source of my creation. And he tries to do that by external research. He tries to use that by determine who is the source of his creation by employing his faculties, his senses, and his intellect. And what he does is, for a hundred years, by his calculation, which is far greater period of time by our calculations, he, he crawls down the lotus flower, he looks around, he casts his gaze out into the darkness, he thinks about it, you know, he ponders it, he scratches his head. For a hundred years, by his calculation, he did research based on his senses and through research throughout the external material creation. And as a result of all of his efforts, he came up with nothing, nothing conclusive. And he used this example. He says, when a seed fructifies, then the original seed cannot be seen. When the seed of a banyan tree germinates, produces, and grows, and becomes a sapling, and eventually becomes a huge tree covering acres and acres of land, you can no longer determine the original seed. Similarly, the Lord is described not only as a seed from which the universe comes, which can no longer be identified or, or found, He's also comparing to the cotton threads which compose a large quilt, for instance. You see the quilt, but you don't see the horizontal and vertical threads which comprise the quilt. And similarly, it's perfectly correct that when the seed which is generated from the navel of Mahavishnu become manifest as this entire cosmic creation, one can no longer understand the cause of the cosmic manifestation. And even though that same Lord comprises the threads, vertical and horizontal, which make up this universe, one sees only the universe, one does not see the threads. One sees the forest, but one does not see the minutia. Uh, one does not anur yamsha manu yamsha. One sees the big, the macro, but one doesn't see the micro, that indefinable, ineffable living being who pervades and supports. Says, I support, and from me all living beings are generated. I am in them, but they are not in me. I know them, but they don't know me. Now in the sixth canto, there's a very interesting conversation between Yamaraj and the Yamadudas. Yamadudas, as was their custom, their habit, they'd done it millions of times before. They went to collect Ajamil, Ajamil living with a common law, a common law arrangement with a prostitute, life of crime, they circled his, the neck of his subtle body, dragged him away to the abode of Yamaraj for punishment. And he screamed, Narayan, Narayan. He screamed the name of his youngest son in abject terror. At that moment, the effulgent emissaries of Narayan, Puran Vishnu and the spiritual world appeared and they intervened. They prohibited the Amadudas from taking away Yam, uh, Ajamil for punishment. And Yamadudas came back and they're looking at their master differently. There's not quite the same unqualified respect. They have a sort of a suspicious look in their eyes and they say, we thought that you were supreme. We thought that your orders are the final word. And yet we just came back from an incident in which your orders were trumped by these effulgent bluish skinned forearm uh, entities who describe themselves as representatives of Vishnu. What have you got to say about this? Kind of challenging a little bit. Yamaraj says, Paro Maranyo Jagadash Santushtata Otam Pratam Paravad Yatravisham 
ידם שתושע שתיתי ג'נמן אשע נשיר תבד ישע בשן הלא כהן. He said, my dear servants, up until this point of time, you've never seen my order counteracted. You've thought of me as being the supreme. You couldn't have imagined anyone above me from whom I take orders. But now is the day of your enlightenment. I am not supreme. Above me and above all the other demigods, including Indra, Chandra, Brahma, Ganesh, and Shiva, is one supreme Lord and controller. Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu are but his partial expansions. They are the partial manifestation of his energy. They are, it's true, in charge of the creation, in charge of the maintenance, and in charge of the annihilation of this universe. But he is that one who has pervaded and supported everything manifested. He is like the two threads that form the length and breadth of a cotton cloth. Now let's look at the position of Yamaraj and see the truth of his utterance. Now Yamaraj, what is his sovereignty? When you think about it, he's not all-powerful. He doesn't control everything and everyone. There are moving and non-moving living beings. Yamaraj does not control any of the non-moving living beings, which are uncountable. They're uncountable. Yamaraj it only has control amongst a certain percentage, a certain small percentage of the non-moving living beings. Amongst I'm sorry, of the moving living beings. Amongst the moving living beings, there are many animals also. And the animals are not subject to the punishment of Yamaraj. Animals do not do wrong. Animals do not accrue karma. They simply act according to their instincts. You can't ask a tiger to be vegetarian. When a tiger pulls down a deer and eats its flesh, the tiger is not accumulating sinful activities. You cannot make the demigods accountable. The demigods are not dragged before Yamaraj for accountability. They've already ascended. They've already qualified for habitation in the pious planets, the higher planets. They're not free from attachments. They're not free from the shackles of material nature, but they're not where they are because of having performed sinful activities. So Yamaraj is not in charge of the non-moving living beings. He's not in charge of the animals. He's not in charge of the reptile. He's not in charge of the fish, the aquatics. He's not in charge of the, the demigods. And neither does he have sway over the devotees of the Lord. And we'll talk about that just in a moment. Yamaraj is in charge of those moving living beings who should know the difference between right and wrong and who may know the difference between right and wrong, but consciously transgress the basic laws and rights of other living beings, whether it be to an animalistic lack of control over their own senses, or some sinful living beings are motivated to act in the way they act because they enjoy inflicting pain and suffering on others. They actually enjoy other suffering. So there are two kinds of sinful beings who are under the control of Yamaraj. There are those who are not necessarily malicious, but they're not in control of their senses. They're just like animals, although they have the human form. Only in the human form is one accountable. Only those souls who have taken a human form of birth are amongst those who are dragged away at the end of life to Yamaraj for accountability. And amongst those who are human form, human body, there are two types. There are the animalistic people whose senses are out of control, and then there are the type like Ravana who enjoy the suffering of others. Magrari is a good example. So Yamaraj says, I'm, I don't control all living beings. I don't even control most living beings. The mass majority of living beings are outside of my control. I only control those who are sinful, either willfully sinful or sinful because of lack of sense control. So Yamaraj gives the Yamadudas a bit of advice which is going to help them moving forward. It's going to help them do their job better with more discernment and more discrimination than they had up to this point in time. They needed to 
compute. They needed to reconcile what had happened to them in the death chamber of Ajamil in such a way as they could do a better job in the future. So Yamaraj instructs them as their guru. And don't forget, Yamaraj, although he's not the supreme, he is a representative of the supreme. He is one of the 12 Mahajans. Uh, <clears throat> what is it? Vyashika. Uh, um, Vyashika Narada Shambhu, Kapila Komara Manu, Pralada Janaka Bhishma, Bala Vyashika Vayu. This is a statement by Yamaraj. He's describing, listing the 12 Mahajans. There's Shiva, there is Kapila, there is the four Kumaras, there is Manu, um, there is Sukadeva Goswami, there's Prahlad Maharaj, there's Bali Maharaj. Uh, there's Janaka, the father of Sita. Um, there's uh, there's uh, uh, Brahma himself. And then Vayu, Vayu means me. Yamaraj is an authority. So not only can the Yamadutas, his servants, take benefit from his guidance, but we can also learn a lot by hearing the descriptions, the nectar coming from the lips one of the greatest devotees of the Lord, Yamaraj, the Lord of Death. And he tells his servants, Jiva Navakti Bhagavad Nama Gryam Chaitash Nashmariti Chaks Tananadavinam Krishnena No Namati Chaks Rapikara Tanajadavam Ashato Krita Vishnukatam. He says, Moving forward, you want to know now who to avoid based on your setback with Ajamil. So he says, Please bring me only. Those sinful persons, Jivana Vakti Bhagavadna Magriyam, who have never once used their tongues to chant the holy name and qualities of Krishna. Chaitashna Smariti Chakshana Rabin, whose hearts have not remembered Krishna even once. Krishnaya Nunamiti Chakshara Egadapi, and whose heads have never bowed down before Lord Krishna. One time in the early days of the movement in the Haight-Ashbury, Prabhupada gave a lecture at a kirtan, and during the Jayom prayers, Jayom Vishnu Paramam Shad Paramam Mira, everyone bowed down. You know, we also, in Spanish for we have a lot of Mormons, and uh, they're coming for the first time. So after we do the RT, you know, we, we, just re we just do it. We do it after every RT. We don't even think about it. We all bow down. And, and usually it's me or Govinda Bhakti in Salt Lake City. We say the Prema Dhani prayers. Jayam Vishnu Param Param Saram Sadabhasa. Jayam Vishnu Param Param All glories to some of the devotees and the devotees all bow. You know, in this pious Mormon area, most of the people who come to our Sunday feet, they bow down. They just, it's God, I'm a servant. I should bow down. What the heck? You know, it doesn't cost me anything. I'm, I'm stepping right into my own eternal position as a servant of God. How about that? I, I have no problem with that. Even though they've never done it in their own churches, they, it's, it's, some, it's something in our service they came to. They don't know what to expect in our service. Everything is you know, pretty much comprehensible. The lecture is very seeker-friendly. They understand. There's an explanation why to chant kirtan. The RT is... You know, a little little different, but, you know, it's offering to God. And then, after the RT, all of a sudden, there's these strange words. Jaya Vishnu Pad, Paramansa, Paramakachari, Asatera, Shri Shimadis, Divine Grace, AC. Who is his Divine Grace, AC, Bhaktivedanta? What is all this? And everyone's bowing down all of a sudden. And they do it. 99.9% .9 of the people that come to our service for the first time bow down. They don't have a problem with it. I remember the story that was told at, in Haight-Ashbury. Prabhupada gave his lecture, it was a kirtan, and he said the Jayam prayers. And everyone bowed down except one hippie. And after the Premadani prayer, he said, how come I don't feel like bowing down? And Prabhupada said, that is your disease. That is your disease. So those who are so diseased, so polluted with pride, and false prestige, will not bow down even once, not chirapi adapi, tanajadama shato kritam. They're so absorbed in that which is temporary, that which is non-permanent. They're so bound up and conditioned 
by the modes of material nature. They're so into pursuing sense gratification or causing suffering to others, they do not bow down even once before Lord Krishna. Therefore, Yamaraj tells his servants, bring me, bring me those fools and rascals who've never once chanted the name of the Lord, never once bowed down before the Lord, whose hearts have never once remembered. Bring me all those fools and rascals for punishment. When the Lamadudas heard this, it says they were struck with wonder. It says, since then, it said, as soon as they see a devotee, they have given up the dangerous behavior of approaching devotees. For the Yamadudas, approaching a devotee is dangerous. Just like it was dangerous for Lord Brahma to steal the cows and coward boys and put them in a cave. It was dangerous for Indra to cause a deluge over Vrindavan. They, they were playing a very, very risky game. So similarly, whenever a Yamadura approaches a devotee, he's playing a very dangerous game. And even later on, Yama says, evam nirparam shudhyo bhagvati anante um, saratmana vidatite kala yogam. Devotees generally are those who have solved the basic problems of life, the birth problem, the death problem, the disease problem, the old age problem, by approaching the lotus feet of the Lord. So they are not candidates for punishment. They are generally free from sinful activities. And yet Yamaraj goes on to say that even if they do perform some sinful activities due to the pattern of their past behavior or some unfortunate circumstances, he still tells his servants, Yamadudas, categorically do not approach the devotees. Devotees are considered saintly because they're rightly situated. They may fall down. We can't say that every devotee is perfect. We can't say that devotees don't have shortcomings. But we can say that as long as they're moving forward, they fall down. As long as they get up, they go down. As long as they bounce back up and keep on the path of devotional service, no other atonement no other rectifications needed. They just keep chanting, keep their faith in the spiritual master. They will achieve perfection. All unwanted things will be destroyed just as the rising morning sun very easily destroys the fog. Therefore, although Yamaraj is a controller, although Brahma is a controller, although Varuna is a controller, Although Kavera is a controller, there are many controllers in this material world. Ishvara Parama Krishna. There is only one controller who is the controller of all of the controllers and who has no, no controller over him. There is only one cause who causes all of the cause and his effects, but who himself has no other cause, and he is called Krishna. Govindam Adipurusham Tamaham Bajami. We'll end today and revisit this verse tomorrow. Thank you very much for being with me. I would normally ask Rob to make a comment, but he says he doesn't have a very good connection, so we'll have to forego Rod's comments. Uh, look at who, wow, a lot of people jumped on board. Thank you. Anjali, she, but we can say as long as they fall and they come back up and just keep chanting, having faith in their spiritual master. That is the conclusion of Krishna. Krishna is very staunch and protecting his devotees. When other people might say, okay, that's it, that's enough, you shouldn't continue to support him, Krishna says, don't tell me how I should deal with my devotees. Aham bhakta parirya I am in the hearts of my devotees. When you criticize my devotees, even when they come up short, even when they do something that society does not approve of, when you criticize my devotees, you're criticizing me. So back off. Even the same message is given by Yamaraj to his servants, the Yamadudas. When you see a devotee, when you see someone chanting Hare Krishna, you do not bring your microscope and look for faults. You back off. You let them continue to execute their devotional service. Krishna's got the charge of them and he will make and mold them. He will get them to where they need to be. So thanks for that comment, Anjali. Yes, Chandra <laughs> Shekhar says, I'm motivated to chant. <laughs> I hear you're in Utah, up in northern Utah. That's good. 
ask those guys if they'd be willing to put up some posters in Brigham City and all for the upcoming Festival of Colors. They can pick them up in Salt Lake City or I can send them to them. We're only a month away. I'm starting. There's so many things going on here. It's like, <laughs> wow. Yes, moving forward. Prapanov Gopal. We haven't seen him for a long time. Thanks for jumping on. He says, Om Shri Hari Sharam. Yes, Anjali. Yamaraj is one of the 12 Mahajans. The reason we have so many comments is Anjali is with us today. She's the comment queen. We know that when Anjali listens to our talk and comments, we're going to shoot right up to the top of the Facebook algorithms. Yes. Bhakti Gary, please accept my obeisances. Gene says, love Oscar. I'll put a picture of him up one of these days. Anjali talks about the at-risk boy, Narada Muni, his transcendental body. Yes. Terry. Terry gives us a blessing. She puts her blessing on Chiru and by Bobby. Talks about the beauty of the birds. Game Changers. Yes, if you haven't seen it, highly recommend it, if, especially if you're an athlete on a plant-based diet. It's the best diet for athletes, and it's proven over and over again in this video. Proud people looking at themselves in the gym. So comely look at the mirror. Out of balance. Out of balance. <clears throat> Jay says, I'm pretty entertaining. I'm sure I can whip up some transcendental music. So it sounds like Jay is like leaning towards joining us. Here, if you decide definitively to come, give me a picture. Give me a little bio. I'll put you on the website. We will promote you on Facebook and our website. Just give me your promotional materials. We'd love to have you as part of the upcoming Festival of Colors. He says, I'm not a GJ since at least 2005. Well, in 2005, you were hot. If you want to revive those skills, uh, we will provide the forum. <clears throat> Raquel, good morning. Hare Krishna, Vai Bobby, Pranams. Anjali has a little emoji of a parrot there. Thank you for giving Oscar a forever home. Natasha, Hare Krishna, Jean, Hare. Thanks to everyone for joining us. I had a great time this morning kicking off the week. I'm looking forward to joining you 23 hours from today, from now for Transcendental Tuesday. More nectar, the pastimes of Krishna and his eternal devotees. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna.